Uh, Sherman Act outlaws uh, conspiracy and restraint of trade. And um, I forgot the second clause, but basically it's really all it says. It's very vague. It's been held to mention to mean price fixing of some sort, uh, like a cartel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, no, it doesn't mention anything. It's, just, it's very vague. It's like a two-sentence. Um, then the Clayton Act in 1913-14 adds some stuff and creates the Federal Trade Commission. <coughs> so most of the antitrust law is simply accretions of, of, of decisions. The antitrust courts, the courts, Department of Justice, and the Federal Trade Commission, they can do whatever they want. I mean, basically, they declare anything monopolistic or anything, merger. It's, it's, purely, it's purely administrative fiat. Uh, so... Um, at the peak of the antitrust hysteria, which really came in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s, approximately, um, anything could be considered and was considered monopolistic. Uh, if you charge a price the same as your competitors, it's called, called collusion. As we know, the most prices tend to be the same. Obviously, you know. uh, uh, Hershey bars and Nestle bars will be the same, <laughs> be about the same. Otherwise, one of them is going to be in trouble. Um, and uh, if you charge a price lower than your competitor, it's considered predatory price cutting and unfair competition. If you charge a price higher than your competitor, it's considered monopolistic. So whatever you did, it can be considered monopolistic. So it's purely arbitrary on the part of the government. There was no rule of law. There was no statute you can interpret in any you know, rational sense. And in those days, of course, uh, I can't get into it in this course particularly, but um, they, they actually took seriously the economic model of perfect competition. If the competition in the market wasn't, quote, perfect, unquote, which meant it wasn't, meant that if any firm could affect its market in any way, by, by, by making a better product, by competing more actively, something that somehow meant it was monopolistic. So in that basically you can outlaw everything. And so they could selectively then move in. And right now, most, but most antitrust, are, right now, almost all antitrust suits are private. 90% of antitrust Charges are made up by the government by other firms in the industry, and even the government ones are at the behest of other firms. And usually, what it is almost exclusively is inefficient firms are trying to screw their competitors by getting the government to hobble their competition. So, if IBM does better than Control Data Corporation or something, Control Data will take file antitrust is you know, it's unfair, blah blah blah. If they can get away with it, either they get away with it, which they say cripple the competition, or else they make the it's like a blackmail thing. They make the other guys settle out of court for a handsome fee. Most Private antitrust suits are settled out of court with a poor victim has to pay up. It's really like blackmail with the government being the enforcer. Anyway, good. Um, when you have a budget, yeah. Right? <coughs> no. It's a, oh, yeah. If you raise, in other words, if the merger, I mean, a merger could be just for efficiency purposes. I mean, usually, uh, yeah. You have to keep the price down. All you have to get them down. The thing now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. No, well, it depends on the, on the uh, uh, well, I think, I think Texas Air did bust it in the sense they just don't hire, they just, they don't, when the contract runs out of it, they just don't hire uh, union workers. They hire non union machinists or pilots or whatever it is. No, no, no. It's not your fault. It's, uh, no, no, you can't, well, if you, if you have, you can't deny them a vote or something. In other words, if they, if they can call for an election, a bargaining, collective bargaining election. Uh, but if they don't have a collective bargaining election, in many of these cases, the, the union wouldn't, the workers wouldn't vote for a union anyway. And so, um, the, uh, in many cases, and they see the non-union workers are people who can't get union jobs anyway because they've been squeezed out. See, because, you know, unions push this, the supply curve of, of workers to the left. Right? That was a rule. They, they, they exclude a whole bunch of people. So this is a machinist union, let's say. Union machinists are getting a, a lot higher pay than non-union machinists, but they can't. The non-union machinists can't get into the union. The jobs are frozen out. It's a control of entry. So you can turn to a pool in many cases of non-union machinists, pilots, stewardesses, and all that. And just then, uh, they'd be once you hire them, they'd be in favor of keeping the union act. They realize that jobs are at stake. Especially in the airlines industry, they're all going bankrupt anyway if they have excessive union wages. See, what happened in the, in the airline industry was all monopolistic. The, the CA, C, CAB, the Civil Air and Audit Board, um, from the very beginning, in the 1930s, monopolized the airline industry and, and assigned routes. In other words, only Eastern Airlines could fly from Boston to New York or something. That's it. 
anybody else gets flies gets is outlawed. Right? And so they restricted drastically, to, and they assigned routes, and they drastically restricted competition. They only let a few airlines in the industry. For a long time, for example, only Pan Am could, Pan Am could fly in the Pacific. Nobody else could do it. It's illegal. So by doing that, they first raised, cut production and raised prices. But after a long, after 30 years of this stuff, the, the, the airline gets monopolistic. They, 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 the cost gets bid up. They pay excessive wage rates to, to pilots and stewardesses and all that. They become, the costs go way up. They get lazy. And so they wound up not, not making money anyway, even with the regulation, even with the monopoly, they lost money. In other words, in the long run, and many, like with the railroads, monopoly you know, it puts the boots of the whole industry. So in the case of the airlines, only United Airlines, I think, fought against deregulation finally in the late 70s. So this, all the other airlines realized, look, we're going down the tubes anyway, we might as well try the private market. And so, of course, the deregulation, interesting about deregulation, by the way, it shows the economic theory in action. Nobody, no airline economics expert or airline expert predicted what would happen. In other words, Deregulation came around 1978, 79. Nobody realized what the change of pattern would be. Nobody realized it'd be spokes instead of the spoke hub stuff. Just the way it worked. I mean, in other words, in the old days, if you flew from New York to San Francisco, you almost always flew nonstop, right? And that's it. Now, very few people fly nonstop. Now, it's almost always a hub situation. You go to Denver or something, everybody flies into Denver and they fly out. It works that way. Somehow it's more efficient to get these other cities coming in. So that's the way it went. Nobody predicted this, you know, what would happen. Um, at any rate, this, um, so some, some mergers, uh, in this case, they, they're going to try to operate without the, without the machinist union. Uh, and, um, and what happened with these non-union airlines like Texas Air is that they pay much lower salaries to stewardesses, pilots, etc. They don't get enormous salaries, these people, enormous. Uh, and so now they're being brought down to earth, so to speak. One of my colleagues, which remained nameless, uh, the Marxist, who was, was married to a, a steward of the Pan Am, and he was very much against deregulation, not only because he's a Marxist, but also because he realized this would lead to the end, lower prices for, for passengers and the end of the monopoly rent, so to speak, monopoly wage rate enjoyed by stewardesses of Pan Am. <laughs> Flight attendants, that's what he's supposed to say now. At any rate, to get back to the, uh, the sugar thing, it's in the middle of the sugar trust and its saga. I'm going to do a few more of these examples and then point out the significance of all this in, in relation to other historians, various historians. Do you remember the sugar, when I left off on Tuesday, the sugar trust had again merged with Arbuckle. Arbuckle had moved, moved in to compete with the sugar, American sugar refining company, which was an attempt at monopoly. And they finally, and the prices went down again and so forth, so they finally absorbed, they had an agreement between Havemeyer, who was the head of American Sugar Refining Trust, and Arbuckle, they wound up with another big cartel, 1901. So by 1902, they formed a new American. All the cartels were called American. All the mergers were called American Sugar Refining Company. 1902, they wound up with a larger one with 90% of the out, output of the refined sugar. You think that'd be enough? There are only three independents left. Three small independent sugar producers, and um, and they jack the price up. Of course, profits go up. They they jack it up from 4.6. Um, Cents per hundred weight, I guess it was, to 5.3. And uh, they think they're doing great. And then again, the same damn thing happened. They start again with uh, new competitors. In other words, they cut production uh, as soon as they, and raise the price and raise profits. As soon as they do that, new, new competitors come and increase their production. And so, and the price has to fall again. And once again, it falls by 1905 to about four, four and a half cents, back down to what it was before. And now you have new competitors, and now the Sugar Trust by 1904 is only 70% of the total output. <clears throat> and no better. And, and the whole cartel, the whole merger system collapses at that point and doesn't come back again until World War I. Once again, just as in the steel industry, uh, which went, where the government recartelizes the industry on behalf of alleged war, uh, you know, war effort, uh, the whole merger system once again collapses in the sugar refining. And it repeats in industry after industry. Well, I'll just give a few more examples of this. And it's fascinating how time and time again they try a cart, they merge, they have a big new merger, and they, they try to have a monopoly. And, they, and the whole point of a monopoly, of course, is to try to cut production and raise prices and raise profits. As soon as they do that, new competitors come in, they back down again. There's new competitors, and it can never, it's like, it's like uh, pushing back the waves or something. It never works. By 1914, the sugar trust is down to 54%. Total share of total output. Uh, 
<clears throat> so prices are back down, the whole thing is lower, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Habermeyer, who made a statement, as you remember, the tariff as a mother of trusts, uh, repeated the statement and he made it, you know, repeated it at length for Congress. And what he said was that uh, we we never would have tried even to have a merger or monopoly without a high tariff wall to keep out foreign competition. He said. Uh, uh, was built up sh the, the cartel was on uh, the merger was built up. He said under quote enormous protection. Without the tariff, I doubt if we should have dared to take the risk of forming the trust. I certainly should not have risked all I had in a trust unless the business had been protected as it was by the tariff. That so was a very clear statement by one of the top monopolists, so to speak, or trust persons. That the tariff is the mother of trust. And he of course made the statement. His quote. Um, at any rate, the um, there's also the leather trust, which is kind of interesting, the, uh, because the the leather company, U.S. leather company, when it was formed in 1893, was a, had more ca higher capitalization, was a bigger company even than the Standard Oil Trust. It was a huge company. We don't think much about leather, but um, the um, in the leather business, there's the the uh, sole leather industry, which was highly competitive. This is what we're talking about. Sole leather. It was leather for, I guess, soles of shoes. And um, a lot of small firms, there was very little capital required to enter, so there was a lot of easy entry into the, into the industry. And the five of the largest leather firms, or tanners, I guess they're called, firms that make leather. Um, five tanners, the five largest ones, and mostly concentrated in New York and Pennsylvania in that period, so they're fairly close together. Like the brewery industry was concentrating in, in, concentrated in uh, Brooklyn and New York, etc. Um, they all got together to form the U.S. Leather Company in uh, 1893. It had a capitalization, its total assets capitalization was $130 million, the largest capitalized, largest firm in the country at that point, largest corporation in the country. Uh, Standard Oil at that point was only $102 million, the whole Standard Oil Trust. So, because um, it doesn't get the play of, of the oil industry, but it's the largest corporation in the country at that point. It controlled, at that point, 58% of the sole leather with that merger, and 58% of the of so, panned sole leather, I guess is the correct term for it. 72% uh, of hemlock leather, 30% of oak leather, but the, the overall is 58%. And in the detail. Um, so what happens with this thing? Here's the biggest company in the country, controls 58% of the output. What happens to it? Total flop of room. Makes losses. It starts off immediately with a loss of $1.3 million in the first year. Um, it thought it could, again, it could cut production and raise prices. It thought it would have an economy of large scale. Didn't work. The profit, it made losses. The profits were low. The stocks collapsed. There are no dividends. Stock prices collapsed, etc. Um, prices continue to be competitive. There's too much competition, new competition coming in. Uh, and the small tanners began to outcompete the large tanners I mean, just, you know, when they try to raise the price. And finally, in 1904, the thing went bankrupt. In other words, after 11 years of losses, the, US, the mighty U.S. Leather, leather Company went bankrupt, kaput, finished. Uh, again, another merger going down the drain. <coughs> Uh, same way with the cornstarch industry. Cornstarch industry had a big merger, try to create a trust, and uh, they had 70% of the cornstarch industry. Again, a, a very large factory. Again, there's a severe competition comes up, and the whole thing co collapses once more. Again, there's another merger. 1900 is a further merger. This is 1893, a bigger merger, and they had 90% of the starch in the in the, in the industry, 90% of the cornstarch. What then happens is, independent of starch, corn starch got to be so expensive. In other words, they, they take, they have 90%, this is the, the so-called United Starch, the National Starch Company, merger company. Uh, so naturally, in order, the whole point of the merger is to be able to cut production and raise prices. As soon as they do that, corn starch gets so expensive that industries using starch start using other kinds of starch. In other words, corn starch now becomes uncompetitive compared to um, the other starch. I think um, and, I think potato starch. 
So, so people start using mills and factories which use starch as raw material, start shifting from cornstarch to potato starch, and the whole thing again collapses. Um, independent mills spring up uh, either with potato starch or new cornstarch mills using a new process, hydraulic process, which is brand new, lowering the cost of manufacture. The profits of the National Starch Company begin to collapse, and in a few years, they're down to 40%, from 90% of the total output to 40%. So once again, this thing is heartwarming, and what's going to happen is very fast. Merged monopolies collapse time and time again, industry after industry. And the same thing, it's just a process of illustrating uh, economic law at work. Same thing happens in the glucose, the glucose industry, which is similar to the starch industry. The same damn thing, thing. Monopoly after monopoly, merge monopoly after merge monopoly. Doesn't work. In 1897, they formed the big merger of the glucose sugar refining company, $40 million company, with 85% of the glucose. glucose. Um, 1997, and um, and at first they had high profits. They raised the price. They cut production. Everything is hunky dory. And very soon, new new people come into it. They say, "Hey, they got high profits in glucose. Let's build a new glucose factory." And new glucose firms come in. The Illinois Sugar Refining Company, the New York Glucose Company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, which, by the way, was put in by Rockefeller as, as an investment. And uh, and so with new machinery, by 1901, the glucose companies back down at 45 percent of the output, and they have to cut prices. They make a lot of losses, and their stock collapses, and bingo. Um, the um, and in 1902, they try another consolidation, a new mighty merger of the of the various the big glucose companies, the mighty corn products company. Now the corn products refining company, which now has 80% of glucose. This is 1902. And uh, corn products. And, uh, and again, the same thing happens. The same sort of story. They expect they had high profit. They scrap a lot of their plants. Hey, we're going to take, take a lot of plants out of, plants out of production, cut production, raise prices. And, and again, new starch factories come in, uh, glucose factories, better ones, newer ones, Peel Brothers, Warner, Warner Company. The, the mighty corn products company begins to collapse, profits decline, high cost of corn limits the market, heavy losses, the stock collapses, and the whole company more or less goes under. By 1903, they're only producing, one year later, they're producing only 45% of the glucose market. From 80% to 45% in one year. <laughs> uh, 1906, they try another mighty new merger, with 70, called the Corn Products Refining Company, with $91 million company, with 74% of the Product and very shortly that. But what happens to them is they realize they couldn't raise the price. They kept low prices, so the company kept on, but they didn't. They didn't achieve any kind of monopoly price. It's fine with them, with me. You know, they just stick to low cost of production and distribution. So any company to succeed had to not be a monopolist. In other words, had to act as if they were competitors. They were competitive. Hmm. Same thing happens with the gunpowder trust. Another not too well. Study Trust, the DuPont Company, which has always been the major gunpowder company. Before they were producing nylons and stuff, they were producing, they started as arms and gunpowder manufacturers. And um, DuPont led the way in 1872 to form a mighty 43 corporation merger, a mighty gunpowder trust. <clears throat> and uh, they built, they formed it by not by predatory price cutting. Once again, no, they never try to undercut their competition. What they did is they simply bought them out and a very high fee. And um, leaving only a couple of companies, and once again, the whole thing begins to, uh, their, their share of the market begins to collapse. And uh, finally, they just had to go, they just went, by the time dissolved by 1911, after many years of struggling to maintain, some, get some kind of monopoly price out of it. Uh, which they never succeeded in. <clears throat> um, by the way, in the in the case of uh, the Gunpowder Trust, they had two hundred and thirty. They had, um, I think, many firms. They had many firms. Yeah, they had about uh, forty-three firms in this merger. They couldn't prevent their own part, their own plants, their own different subsections of the, of the companies from from cheating, quote cheating unquote. The salesmen, like once again, the, the sales vice presidents, the sales managers. Are constantly offering rebates and discounts 
to get more people for themselves and for their department, even though it was one merged company. They didn't act as if they were, they were acting as, they were salesmen. They, were, they wanted to make more sales and they competed against each other. They couldn't even stop that, and much less external competition. They couldn't stop internal competition from the sales managers. Um, and then, of course, new entrants come in and um, help compete with untitled trust. The whole thing had to collapse. Um, and a general study of these trusts, okay, um, of nearly 100 trusts or mergers formed in 1899 and 1900, for example, they have of 100, they have 100 merged so called trusts. We'll define a trust as being a merged attempted at monopoly. Okay. Um, 1899 and 1900. In one year, three quarters of these firms are not paying dividends. In other words, they were losing money, basically. They were in bad financial shape. And only one year after they were formed, uh, there are many other, several other statistics I'll mention on this thing, but the promoter's hopes were not realized in most cases. New competition comes in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Coco points out of the 50 largest corporations in 1909, for example, um, by, in 20 years, 20 had dropped out of the 50 largest. And there was a very high turnover of large companies. Um, now, Coco has a lot of very good stuff. His first two chapters on mergers and failure mergers are very good. The other very good person, even better, um, Coco's book, by the way, came as a thunderclap when it came out in the 1960s, as I'll point out in a minute. Uh, before Coco, I think Coco was, what, 1960-something? 65, something like that. Anyway, 1960s. Uh, before that, the, the best study of, of mergers was made by a guy named Arthur Dewing, which nobody paid any attention to, Arthur S. Dewing. Uh, D E W I N G. He had, he had uh, made a study of the, he had written a book called Corporate Promotions and Reorganizations, I think 1906 or something like that. Um, and, um, and then he'd written an, a, a journal article, a scholarly journal article in 1911, studying what had happened to these mergers, a random sample. And then he wrote an excellent textbook on corporate finance called Financial Policy of Corporations which went into about 20 editions. I think the first edition was like 1920 and continued for about 30 years. It might still be in print for all I know. And it's a marvelous book. It's not really a textbook. It's chock full of footnotes and all sorts of other great stuff. But nobody ever read this except corporate finance people. I mean, the economists didn't read it, the historians didn't read it. It was sort of isolated in the, in the stream, in the mainstream. Anyway, doing is, that's probably the best study. Um, Coco is a, a second, comes in second. Uh, so what doing showed is that you had two trust waves, two merger waves. First, the smallest one was the late 1880s, early 1890s. That was the first one. Um, and then the biggest one, as I pointed out, was um, late 1880s, 1890s. Then the largest one was 1898, uh, 1901. That was the most, by far the biggest, when most of the mergers took place. Uh, so he, what he did was he took a, um, uh, for example, he said 130, in this second wave, 130 mergers were made, 130 trusts, 130 different industries. Uh, Climax, of course, by U.S. Steel Corporation, which was 1901, had a capitalization of $1.3 billion. And I've already mentioned about the steel industry. It's the Morgan. And uh, what he did was he took a, um, a random sample of 35 industries and, and went into detail what happened to them. How do they, what happened to them after they, what was the expectation of the promoters before they were merged? What happened to them afterward, a year after, five years, ten years afterward? His generally, he, and he, first, he also asked the question, why did it stop in 1901? Why was there a sudden cessation, sudden stopping of, of mergers in 1901? It wasn't any kind of antitrust stuff. And he said, well, they turned out badly. They just didn't work. They didn't suppress competition. They didn't they didn't realize big economies of scale. See, they thought one of their theories was if, if, a, if a large company is more efficient than a small company, and a very, very large company must be even more efficient. Well, of course, it didn't work that way. There were limits to economies of scale, and they, they tapped them, especially by this kind of artificial merger. Um, their, their stocks declined steadily. They made losses. They had new competitors coming in, all the stuff I've talked about. Few of them paid any dividends, dividends at all. Most of them lost money. The shares of stock, the shares of the out, of output of the industry declined steadily. Many of them actually went bankrupt. They just collapsed totally. Those that didn't collapse had a cut back. I mean, you, 
keep declining steadily like U.S. Steel, which has been in miserable shape ever since. So you just see studies that say a random sample of 35 of these trusts. <clears throat> and he found out, for example, that the average, on the average, um, the average of the 35, 25 percent of these of these mergers uh, earn more in the first year before the trust. You mean yeah, just earn more just before the trust than in the year afterwards. So then in, in one year after. In other words, you, you could take a hundred companies forming a trust, let's say, in some industry. You take their average rate of return, average rate of profit, just before they form the trust, and compare it with the trust after it was formed. Uh, Twenty, the average drop was twenty-five percent drop in profits. Uh, uh, after ten years, it's also more than the average earnings of ten years later. So you have ten years of the trust is still earning less than the, the individual companies did before the trust. Uh, the estimates of the promoters and bankers who form the, the trusts. Um, were 50 percent higher than the actual earnings in the first year, and much higher over the first 10 years. In other words, inflated estimates. You asked about water stock. In other words, they say we earn 10 million dollars next year and only earn 5 million. That's a 50 percent drop uh, over the expectation of the promoters. Um, of the 35, or put, look at it another way, of the 35 trusts that he's doing studied. <clears throat> Um, 13 had positive earnings in the first year. And um, 13 had first year earnings uh, equal or greater than the pre-trust pre earnings. It was higher first year earnings or, or the same. 22 dropped Dropped in earnings, lower earnings. It was the same for the whole first 10 year period. Most of the trusts had much lower earnings after they formed them than before. Only four had earnings equal to anticipation. Only four earnings were anticipated, okay. equal to anticipation. Um, the uh, or looking another way, earnings after the trust were expected to be forty percent higher than and the average. The earnings after the trust were expected to be forty percent higher than before the trust. Actually, they're twenty percent less in the first year and ten percent less over the first couple several years. So that gives you another way of looking at it. They're expected to be forty percent higher in your former trust. They expect that the, or the promoters expect to have 40 percent higher. It actually dropped from 10 to 20 percent. Um, <clears throat> so some of the reasons he goes into is, that, as I say, just because a larger firm is more economical than a smaller firm doesn't mean a very large firm would be more economical. It depends, if, especially if it doesn't grow organically, especially if it's artificially imposed by this sort of promotion. Uh, <clears throat> it turns out, for example, that management or entrepreneurship is very scarce. Uh, the range of judgment is very scarce, is, is, is limited. Uh, one guy over a huge number of, of aside from the fact that a new competitor is popping up, you know, uh, the range of individual initiative is, is limited. Uh, managerial ability is very scarce, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also, in many cases, the loyalty of, of the managers were weakened. See, what usually happened is that, that they merged, that 20 firms merged into one. The guy used to be the owner or the president of one firm becomes now the manager of that of that division. Well, he's not. He's not, He doesn't care that much anymore as a manager than he did as as an owner. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> also, the salesmen are demoralized. They're supposed to now restrict their their sales. They don't like that. I've already mentioned that. <clears throat> and the larger size often makes them worse competitors to compare to smaller, uh, more mobile owners and much more innovative. Uh, one example of that, I don't know if I mentioned that already, but the current recent years, some great examples of, of very large firms of so-called monopolies or virtual monopolies that have become uncreative, bureaucratic, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, did I mention Xerox and Polaroid yet? That's, that's a classic example. 
Uh, after World War II, <clears throat> in the United States, at least, there was a virtual monopoly of photography by Eastman Kodak. And uh, Dr. Land, when the discoverer of uh, uh, Polaroid camera, comes to this great new discovery, comes to Eastman Kodak and says, look, I have this great thing, and uh, he offered, of course, to sell it to Eastman Kodak, and their experts went over and they said, it won't work. It won't be economic, it won't work, Not, you know, that, so that's it. So he had to go and get, you know, get friends together and get a small bank loan or whatever and start the thing up on, a, on his own company. I wish, of course, I had had 10 shares of the original Polaroid Corporation. <laughs> uh, same thing happened to the guy who invented Xerox, I forget his name. Anyway, same damn thing happened. He goes to the one of the great revolutions in photography, right? He goes to the Eastman Kodak, won't work. <laughs> It's uneconomic, blah, blah, blah. He has to start his own Xerox corporation. The rest of his history. Actually, he's originally Hayloid Xerox, a teeny company. And of course, the, uh, I wish I had 10 shares of that. Another fantastic success story. So once again, the, the monopolist, the big business, doesn't see the situation. You start off a teeny firm, you outcompete these guys for the wall. Uh, <clears throat> there's an excellent book. There's several books on this if you're interested. An excellent book by John Jukes and others. Jukes and other people call it Sources of Invention. It's a marvelous book. I'm not sure it's in print anymore, but it's, uh, it, it, what it did was it, it took all the top inventions of the 20th century, about 80 of them or something, and found out where they were invented, where the, you know, what, what sort of conditions. And it found out almost, almost every case it was done in a, by either an individual inventor or a small firm. It was not done by the, by the big, big research laboratory. Uh, big research laboratories seem to be much better for development after somebody else has invented it, they can then process it and apply it. But for actual inventions, they were, they were a pack of losers, the whole, whole situation, all of them, the top inventions of the 20th century, including Xerox and Polaroid and penicillin and God knows what else, I mean, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, basic oxygen, oxygen process and steel, all these things are in very small laboratories where the people are flexible and they're not bureaucratic, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, another thing that happens is the um, is the peddler, as we'll see in a minute in the retail industry. Get into that in a minute too. Where um, where in most in many cases in retail firms, smaller businesses can outcompete larger ones very easily. You see the peddlers, for example, the flor your local florists are hunted down like like rats <laughs> by, the, by the by the police. Uh, they can very beautifully outcompete the, the official florists. The official Orthodox flora, so to speak, charge ten bucks for a bunch of flowers. You get it for two bucks, better ones, on the corner florist. And uh, he's mobile. He can get stuff easily. He can get, get in out of the rain. He doesn't have to be, you know, he can take the right corners and the right spots. He's not fixed. You know, he doesn't have to pay fixed rent. He's not fixed in one particular. If it's raining that day, he doesn't have, he doesn't have to show up. All these things makes the peddler who has almost no capital. Notice the peddler only has one day's worth of equipment. Um, makes them a very able to outcompete larger stores. As a result of that, the history of the retail industry, I'm, I'll just start that today, but the history of the retail industry in the United States is a whole history of constant attempts by the, by the established firms that, uh, to render illegal, to cripple and, and, and outcompete by law their more smaller mobile, mobile competitors. In almost every city and town in the country, even now, peddlers are illegal. They're still illegal here. They, there are severe licensing requirements. Every once in a while, the mayor tries to crack down on them. They have to outlaw these evil peddlers because they're, they can outcompete retail stores. Well, tough, you know, it's a great thing. Why shouldn't they outcompete them? Why shouldn't the consumers be able to get scarves and pocketbooks and all that for much cheaper? Watches are cheaper than the established official firm. So the fact that you have more capital doesn't necessarily mean you're better to com com competitively. In many cases, you're worse off because you're stuck in a fixed, fixed uh, location, for example. And many of the immigrant groups in the United States came in, they rose up uh, immigrants in the late 19th century, early 20th century, they came in to New York with no money at all, nothing in their, in their pocket, and they get one day's worth of stuff, of capital, so to speak, one day's worth of pedal, peddling equipment, flowers or cloth or whatever it is, and they start with that and they rise up very quickly. And they profits, plow back the profits, finally get a push cart. Push cart, of course, is a massive amount of capital instead of just carrying a thing in a, in a suitcase or whatever. And they, they, they wind up quite wealthy in that, in that way. And so, but now you, we, current low-income groups are having a diff, find it difficult to do that because they need heavy license requirements. They're hunted down by the police, etc., uh, driven out. And New York, and the New York the mayor of New York usually says that it's unesthetic. The major argument against tellers is that the streets are no longer beautiful. And New York, you may say a lot about New York streets. 
Beauty is not one of them. <laughs> Aesthetics is not one of our major, <laughs> one of our major attributes. The idea that somehow the streets have to be cleansed by getting rid of peddlers is pretty extremely phony. Anyway, Dewing winds up, I think a marvelous quote from Dewing, after he's summing up his study of these 35 uh, mergers, what happened to them, etc. And he says this, quote, I've been impressed throughout by the powerlessness, powerlessness of mere aggregates of capital to hold monopoly. The powerlessness of just because just they have a lot of capital equipment. I've been impressed, too, by the tremendous importance of individual innate ability, or its lack, in determining the success or failure of any enterprise. With these observations in mind, one may hazard the belief that whatever, quote, cost problem, unquote, exists, will work out its own solution. The doom of the inefficient waits on no legislative regulation. It is rather delayed thereby. <clears throat> Restrictive regulation will perpetuate the inefficient corporation by f furnishing an artificial prop to support natural weakness. It will hamper the efficient by impeding the free play of personal ambition. It's a beautiful statement that without government intervention, just, just letting it rip without any kind of regulation control, you'll wind up with an enterprise being successful. In other words, regardless of how much capital the person's got, he's got ability to foresee what's going on, to step into the market, to compete. Uh, he or she will do so rather than um, <clears throat> just aggregates of capital. And um, I want to turn next, I just started to start this today, about the history of the retail industry in the United States. Been one constant attempt of new innov of innovation, new innovations is repeating itself, uh, with the orthodox current established retailers trying desperately to crush the com new competition by law, turning the government to outlaw them. Uh, right now, as I say, peddlers are almost illegal almost everywhere, except for severe license requirements. Uh, it starts in the, in the early 19th century, you have to go back to that. Uh, Remember, in the early 19th century, there were no roads. Okay? So the, you, you, there were very little, there were no traveling salesmen, there's nothing, there's no way, you can't travel. So um, what you had was merchants in central markets who were offering goods. And once a year, the out-of-town buyers would come in. They managed to get, make their way to New York or whatever, to, which they still do in many cases in the garment industry, um, to, to look at the samples of equipment and buy them and carry them home. Okay? That was the sort of pre-Civil War, pre-1850s situation. <clears throat> so it was very little standardization, it was a very haphazard kind of setup. <clears throat> uh, in the 1850s and 1860s, with the railroads coming in, a new, a new kind of marketing technology enters the uh, field of retail, namely the traveling salesman, uh, who would you know, take his sample case and travel around and, and go to different merchants, uh, retail merchants, and sell his wares. Uh, the traveling salesman was met by the wholesale merchants in the towns. In other words, in Detroit or Peoria or whatever, you have all these wholesale merchants. The traveling salesmen would come from New York and you know, go to the, the retailers, go straight to the retailers, and compete with the local wholesale merchants. The local wholesale merchants met this whole development of hysteria, with hatred. Uh, the traveling salesman, of course, had no capital except his, 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 his uh, suitcase. And so there's a whole series of state and city licensing laws that crush to crush the traveling salesman, making it, for example, very high license fees, very high anti, I mean, severe anti-peddler laws. Um, and every, every little town has its own license tax. In other words, it would say something like this, anybody who sells anything in our town that doesn't live in our town has to pay a license fee of, I don't know, 20 bucks a year, which is enormous. It means, it means the poor traveling salesman has to pay 20 bucks a year every town he visits, which makes it totally prohibitive. As a matter of fact, the average traveling salesman is making $2,500 a year in those days. He had to pay a license fee out of that of a, over a thousand, which means like almost 40% of his income is absorbed by license fee. Obviously, this is not going to work. So, what you had then was a series of evasions. In other words, the, um, the, um, the peddlers are trying to get, um, evade, the traveling salesmen are trying to evade the license fee one way or the other, sneak into town sell their stuff at retail and get out before they go to the court. Uh, or else they have, um, have phony employees. In other words, they get some resident merchant, like some retail merchant to quote, hire them, unquote, for two weeks. So they wouldn't be illegal. They wouldn't have to pay a license fee. You have phony employee relationship. Um, or they just say, say, skip town dodging the tax collector. Or they bribe the local tax collector, of course. So you have a black market traveling salesman. The result of all this is the traveling salesman is always in a state of semi-legality. Sometimes he was jailed, 
sent, went to jail for non-payment of the license fee. So the, he became a disreputable figure. And as a result of that, the famous traveling salesman farmer's daughter's jokes came in. I don't know if it's still going around, but when I was growing up, it was still a standard dirty joke of the epoch of the traveling salesman joke. The, tra the reason why the traveling salesman was in a state of semi-legality, they're always disreputable, they're half jail, half the time they're skipping the law. At any rate, this goes on for about 20 or 30 years, this kind of nonsense, trying to use the law to oppress, repress the traveling salesman concept. Finally, after about 30 years or so, by about 1880s, the pressure comes to re and is finally repealed. Actually, the Supreme Court finally declares them unconstitutional. But the pressure comes from several sources, kind of interesting. First, first place, uh, the retail merchants want, want this. They, 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 you know, they're getting cheaper wholesale products. Also, another thing that happens is the wholesalers themselves start employing traveling salesmen. In other words, a wholesaler in Detroit will start sending tra uh, traveling salesmen out to their region. So they don't want to have their people outlawed and paying heavy license fees. So in other words, traveling salesmen now begin to be used by the wholesale merchants themselves, and they, they start shifting to support repeal. <coughs> and uh, this happens in Baltimore, happens in Philadelphia, and Louisville, and Atlanta. All these sort of medium-sized cities start shifting, and the salesmen start forming their own associations the pressure for, for lobby for repeal. So you have the, the shift on the base by the local merchants and the, the regional merchants and the salesman association. And finally, the Supreme Court takes notice of this and the whole thing goes down the chute. After 30 years of repression of the poor traveling salesman, the finally, thing is finally over. Uh, and um, made decisions in the 1870s and 80s so anyway, finally the traveling salesmen are accepted, they're, they're no longer disreputable, there's no longer high license fees, they're part of the industry. But again, hysteria hits, it doesn't take much longer for a new, for a new innovation to come. For example, two big things happen. Uh, one is the, about 1895 comes to the department store. You can't imagine the hysteria with which department stores are, were, were met. The department stores are unfair, they're evil, they're, they're out competing poor mom and pop stores. Um, stores that only sell one or two things, apartment stores, they have many floors, makes them unfair, they have ten floors, other stores have only one floor, and so there's a tremendous attack on, on Gimbal, Gimbal's and Macy's and other department stores, and the retailers would the, uh, convene, condemn department stores as being, under, they said, quote, department stores would, quote, result in oppression of the public, and I get this, they're claiming it's for the public interest to suppress, to outlaw department stores. It would result in oppression of the public by suppressing competition and causing the consumer, in the end, to pay higher prices and ultimately create a monopoly. In other words, here's the argument. Here's the apartment stores, Macy's, Gimbal, etc., which are now efficient, out-competing retail stores. If you allow them to do that, they will eventually push all the retail stores out of business, and they will then cut prices, cut production rates by... So for the interest of the consumers, we should outlaw those apartment stores now. Notice the logic of this. Because you, there might be eventually a monopoly by the, an efficient monopoly by department stores. Therefore, we should create an inefficient monopoly right now through the consumers now by outlawing department stores. That's the logic of it. Um, in Germany, there were compulsory cartel systems from about 1880 to about 19, to the end of World War II, more or less. And after World War II was over, the German, Germany no longer had a compulsory cartel system. It was more or less free market, more or less relatively free market. So the former cartelists uh, had an argument to the German parliament, and they said as follows, about 1950, I remember reading it somewhere in a clipping. They, they petitioned to reimpose a compulsory cartel, because they said if you don't have a compulsory cartel, and you have efficient business without compete other business, you wind up with a monopoly, and a consumer would, would suffer. It's the same argument. In order, in order to eliminate a possible future monopoly where the consumers would suffer, we should make the consumers suffer right now with an inefficient monopoly. <laughs> Again, unfortunately, it didn't work. I can't imagine anybody really believe. I can't. My problem is I can't imagine people making these arguments with a straight face, or anybody believing them, or anybody bothering to report them without laughing in their faces. At any rate, that's the, these are common arguments in favor of compulsory cartel, or in favor of outlawing efficient businesses coming up. So there are special taxes on department stores. There were special. Um, uh, licensing requirements or whatever, and finally they, they made it. Another thing which happened about the same time, in the, around, the, around 1900 or so, which also was met with tremendous hysteria, you can't believe it, uh, was the mail order concept. You don't have to go to the store, you just send away, you have a catalog, Sears Roebuck, of course, the famous one in Montgomery Ward. You have, you have samples, you send orders by mail. 
met with fantastic hysteria. All the retail stores have my God, I'll create a monopoly that drives a lot of business. There's unfair competition. Outlaw them. Tax them. Uh, and they organize, for example, special... They said this is a terrible thing. It's Because it's, it's, they don't employ salesmen. And get this. One of the big arguments was that Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Ward are unfair because they don't employ salesmen. That means they have a, a smaller, co lower cost. You notice this. 30 years before that, they were attacking any firm which employed a salesman as being somehow evil. Now, if you didn't, didn't employ salesmen, it's a terrible, unfair thing. <laughs> and so they, they organized, retailers organized mail order catalog burning parties, bonfires, where they, they have traded home clubs. Because this way, of course, if you're a New Yorker or a Philadelphia and you're, you're buying from Sears catalog in Illinois, it means you're not trading from a, a local store, you're somehow injuring a local economy. They had traded home clubs, they had organized burning of, of Sears Roebuck catalog, bonfires, they tossed in the Sears and Monkey Ward catalog. Totally crazed. And they set up special taxes against mail order. So anyway, after the mail order business, the final grudging, and it took a long time for the acceptance of the mail of Sears Roebuck and Mon Montgomery Ward. They were considered monopolists, unfair competitors, they don't have any salesmen. Just like peddlers are unfair, they don't have they don't pay rent. Well, so what? If you can get away without paying rent, great. You're willing to walk around the streets and brave the rain and snow and so forth. Super. Uh, there's no, there's anything which is best for the consumers is best for the, for the economy. <clears throat> and another big threat which came in around the same time as, uh, as the uh, mail order business was the department store. I guess I mentioned it at the very end. The department store, terrible thing. They have eight floors instead of one. God proclaimed that only one floor, every store should be on one floor. You have eight floors and everything is in one. Eight floors is a terrible thing. And a group of retailers convened in 1895 and condemned department stores. They said it would, quote, result in oppression of the public by suppressing competition and causing the consumer in the end to pay higher prices and ultimately create a monopoly. I mentioned last time this is a typical argument of monopolists. They're trying to get a government to give you a cartel. The argument against efficient competitors is that eventually you'll have a monopoly. Well, the answer is, first of all, wait. Don't, don't impose an, an inefficient cartel now because you might have an efficient monopoly 20 years from now. <laughs> Wait for the efficient monopoly and see if they raise prices. They almost never do because then they'll worry about new competitors coming in. So it's, it's uh, typical non nonsense. <clears throat> At any rate, after that, as the department store was accepted, as mail orders were accepted, around the 1920s came a, a new dread innovation, chain stores. Chain stores, my God, chain stores are monopoly, terrible, that squeeze out all these lovable mom and pop stores. There'd be no single stores left, all, every one of, the, one of the wall. When I was growing up in the 1930s, there was a big, big cry by liberals and leftists, break up A&P. A&P then was a big, quote, monopolist, unquote, chain stores. They had the biggest chain of groceries. And they could charge lower prices because they were buying in quantity. They'd buy, you know, 10,000 units of something instead of 12. And so as a result, they've got disc discounts, quantity discounts. They'd be cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, there were also some problems with A&P. Namely, they, they didn't give credit. They didn't deliver as much as small stores do. You have, you have a, a, a trade-off. A smaller, mom, a so-called mom-and-pop store, uh, they know you, they give you credit, <clears throat> and uh, they'll be a lot looser about, ch about, about ch charging, about enforcing it. Uh, they'll deliver later, and, and so forth and so on. So uh, at any rate, Break up A&P. A&P is so big they're going to drive all the stores out of business, all this nonsense. What actually happened <clears throat> in practice <clears throat> was that when the supermarket boom came in, first of all, in World War II, the big change with frozen food, the big invention of frozen food. And second of all, the supermarket concept where you have, because um, before that, A&P, which they're all, they were like mom and pop stores in the sense that you, you had a counter, you went to ask the guy, I want, you know, uh, five cans of so-and-so. <clears throat> the whole idea of a, a self-service supermarket comes in after World War II. <clears throat> and A&P, not being used to this, were the last guys to, to convert. The last people to really understand the supermarket concept. As a result, <clears throat> the average A&P in New York, first of all, A&P has sort of almost went bankrupt, or went quasi-bankrupt. They're down the tubes. <clears throat> they didn't have to be broken up by government coercion. They broke up themselves by inefficiency. And even now, you have an A&P supermarket. Those few that are left, they're crummily, they're crummily organized. They're dirty. They have, they have boxes pile up in the aisles. They have, they have uh, linoleum floors instead of what they, they have wooden floors, excuse me, instead of the tiles. They're just crummy, and they're old-fashioned. They just didn't, they weren't up with it with the current, with innovation. So the, and as a matter of fact, many, many states and cities had chain store taxes deliberately to inflict taxes to try to cripple chain stores. And there are, um, my professor 
uh, economics professor told me about Switzerland, and then that's the same way in the rest of the continent. Uh, in Switzerland, where people are imbued with the ideology that chain stores are evil, they actually walk 10 miles to go to a mom and pop store rather than patronize a chain store because they think it's somehow evil. So at any rate, all this stuff is, is the, this stuff was swept away largely, and then came the supermarkets, and nobody says break up AMP anymore. But you, you couldn't believe how many left-wing and liberal writers in the 1930s and 40s were urging the, the breakup of AMP. Terrible thing, monopoly. First, it was, it was selling cheap stuff and and selling good stuff to the consumer at, at cheap prices. Uh, after World War II, the, the latest thing in, in retailing, which also got big hysteria, was a discount house, which came in in the 1950s, I believe. Uh, <clears throat> heroic discount house, which broke the law. The, um, because of the uh, Clayton Act, which came in in 1913, as we'll see later, and um, the robinson Patman Act, which came in the 1930s, <coughs> Impose a so-called <coughs> fair trade, <coughs> the great, great work of cartel. Fair trade law. Maybe you hear the word fail, fairness, by the way, in, in, in economics. Guard your pocketbook. <laughs> Reach, guard your wallet. <laughs> so fair trade meant it shouldn't compete. In other words, this is a so-called resale price maintenance. <coughs> And once again, the poor, beloved mom and pop stores have to be saved. <clears throat> this was done by trade associations, mom and pop retail stores. You don't have to be a big business to be politically powerful. You can have a lot of retail stores all band together in a trade association. They have a big clout because they have a lot of votes. The resale price maintenance means that the <clears throat> thou shalt not sell this certain product below a certain amount. <clears throat> in other words, you keep the you push this, the price above the free market level. By a cartel arrangement, you push the supply to the left, keep out competition, and raise the price. <clears throat> this is a typical cartel situation. A cartel enforced by the government, federal government, because nobody else can do it, state government, federal government. You have, you have 100,000 retailers that can't, help, they can't form a successful cartel without, without the government imposing it. <clears throat> so retail price maintenance, Officially, the, the manufacturer imposed it. Actually, of course, it was the retailer. The retailers would want to keep, let's say, electric shaver. The classic case was Sunbeam, which was a slave to the retail cartel. They had an electric shaver in those days. I don't know what I like. I don't use an electric shaver. In those days, a typical price would be about thirty dollars, twenty-five dollars. I suppose a lot more now. But anyway, so let's say that we. The, so the, the retailers will go to Sunbeam and say, look, Mr. Sunbeam, we will not buy your product, blah, 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 unless you impose a resale price maintenance, say $30. Now, almost always the manufacturer doesn't care. As long as he sells the product to the wholesaler or the jobber, he doesn't care what the retailer charges. It's not his concern. But the, uh, the law, the resale price maintenance law said as follows. See, a manufacturer can make a contract. <clears throat> if I'm Mr. Sunbeam, I can make a contract with a retailer saying, thou shalt not sell this shaver for less than $30. But that would mean like 100,000 contracts. Nobody wants to go through this nonsense. So the, the resale price maintenance law said that if Mr. Sunbeam makes a contract with one retailer to impose a minimum price of $30, and every other retailer is bound by it. In other words, it's extending contract to statute. It's saying all he has to do is to sign one contract with Joe Jones somewhere and it applies across the board to the whole country, but nobody can sell this thing for less than 30 bucks. And this, this, of course, was imposed upon the Sunbeam by, by the retail cartels, retail association. This is true for most products, appliances, household appliances, vitamins, drugs, of course, even more so, liquor, but liquor which is resale price maintenance from the state governments. Um, so what happened, this meant that prices were much higher than they should have been. There's a whole cartel screwing the consumer. This is in the name, of course, of the welfare state. This, by the way, is the welfare state in action. There's a whole bunch of special special interest groups screwing consumers <laughs> and taxpayers and making them think they're really benefiting. So what finally happened is the rise of the discount house, a heroic group of illegal black market sellers. In particular, in New York, the, the classic ones are Masters, 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 ha Masters House and Corvettes, which just recently went bankrupt for other reasons. Uh, Corvettes and Masters, the whole thing was geared as we now, and of course now there are discount houses all over the place. The discount house was able to sell way below the market, the fixed market price, because they had very, they had very low costs. The thing is, in, in, most, in the old days, uh, not so much anymore. I mean, the, nowadays you can't get a salesman in New York to, to wait on you. If, if there are salesmen at all, as you well know, uh, 
the, the customer is considered to be an intrusion uh, on, on, the, on the valuable leisure time of uh, the clerks. You know, the clerks are yucking it up. Either no clerks at all, no sales, and also yucking it up over coffee. And any, any customer is an unwelcome intrusion. At any rate, uh, in the old days used to be a lot of a lot of service. Okay, you go into a department store or whatever, appliance store, rugs or whatever. You got a lot of a lot of personal service. So masters and Corvette cut out, excuse me, cut out personal service at all. You just have price tags, and you just get the product, and you take it out, and wait online, and buy it, as you do now at 47th Street Photo and other places. Okay? In other words, it's the idea of no frills, no service retailing. So if you know what you want. It's a great thing to do. So if you know you want a sunbeam shave mat, I like to shave, you just go you stand online and pay the discount price. This was illegal <coughs> because they were violating and consciously violating at least the, the, the price minimum, the retail price maintenance law. They'd sell it, huh? Well, they just did it. And uh, it was heroic because everybody started buying it. So it was 20, they sell for $20, something like that. Yeah, they didn't make a no. See, they didn't make a contract. The contract was only with one, one, some, somebody else, right? One store. They didn't violate a contract. They violated the right resale, resale price maintenance law, which said that one contract applies to everybody. That one contract yeah. Applies to yeah. They were breaking the law. No, they weren't breaking any contract. They, they, they made no contract. In other words, they just bought a sunbeam. The That's right. They broke the law. Yeah. No, well, they took them to court. Obviously, the Sunbeam people, and, the, and, and particularly, of course, the Retail Price the Trade Association, took them to court. And they fought it. They took it all the way to Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, by the side of the law, was unconstitutional. It was a magnificent decision. It was somewhere, I guess, the late 50s and 60s. In other words, it was a constitutional test. And uh, finally broke the uh, Retail Price Maintenance Law. It was, a, it was a great day for the consumer. And after that, the whole thing collapsed. The whole price structure. Uh, collapsed, and then we started getting discounts all over the place. I and mean, then you, now you have, and now everything is discount. I mean, you have 47th Street photo. I mean, list price is sort of a joke. One great thing about New York, even though the consumer sovereignty is not, not exactly in order, you can get stuff much cheap, much cheaper here than you can anyplace else. I mean, this 47th Street photo, you get electronic stuff, much, much cheaper than, than list price is sort of a joke here. If you go to other places in the country, they pay list price. They don't know any better. And there's no, there's no discount house unless they get a catalog. Of course. Um, so the whole concept of the discount, the no frills discount store, is a magnificent, magnificent one, and, and now just list price is just a sort of vague, a vague reference point. And nobody really takes it seriously. Um, so, uh, at any rate, of course, recently Corvette went out of business because they had no more function. In other words, after 20 years of, of, of bonanza, they finally wound up with you know they, ever since everybody else was discounting, there's no reason to go to Corvette more than any other place. Uh, they still had vitamins and drugs, I think, took a long time to go discount, although that happened too with health food stores. It wasn't too long ago, about 20 years ago, uh, I went into a, to get some vitamins at a drugstore around my neighborhood, and the guy asked me, it was the list price, this was Theragram, the list price was $9.50, an insane price, okay? uh, and very high as part of this resale price maintenance, because drugs are especially regulated. Uh, they said nine, the list price is $9.50. I said, I'd like to get some biotheragram. He said, look at me. He said, you live in the neighborhood. A strange question you might think to ask. Why should they care whether I live in the neighborhood? And the reason is, of course, they were afraid I was the equivalent of a narc. And I was afraid I was, afraid I was a Gestapo, an espionage, espionage agent for the, for the city regulatory, whatever the heck it is. It goes around and polices prices, used to police prices. Make sure you don't sell them below 950. I said, yes, I live in there. Yes, he said, I've seen you in the neighborhood. And he of course, sold me for 550, which is the true market price. In contrast to the, the crazy 950. So now, of course, it's all over the place. You don't have to be a, a known in the neighborhood to buy cheap vitamins. Because now the discounts are everywhere. It's magnificent. What a great victory for the consumer. And we should hail Mr. Corvette and Mr. Master, whatever their names are. I think it was a, it was a, a Mr. Corvette, E.J. Corvette. Hail them for being pioneers in consumer freedom. And uh, so... Um, but again, of course, these were attacked bitterly by the retailers. They're destroying the fair prices. It's unfair competition. Whenever you hear the words unfair competition, again, watch out. Yeah. Um, uh, is liquor, liquor, liquor is I think, um, yeah, well, I think liquor is. See, liquor is monopolized in the sense that you can't, you can't open a liquor store. See, I couldn't open a liquor store. You have to get a liquor license. They're not issuing any new liquor licenses. You have to buy a liquor license from guys willing to sell. It's like a taxi industry. It's very tightly controlled. So you can't uh, you can't have a liquor store more than 
less than, I don't know, 150 feet or 150 yards or whatever from some other liquor store. There's, there's compulsory spacing. Everybody has a little monopoly turf. It's, a little, it's less regulated than it used to be. So I'm not really sure what the latest thing is. But it's still heavily regulated. Very high taxes, of course, which keeps out competition, raises the cost, raises the price. Uh, huh? I'm not sure. I don't know what the European situation is. Usually liquor is regulated everywhere, but I'm, I'm not sure what happens. Yeah, yeah, uh, hmm, I think so. It's not as bad as liquor, where it's all tightly... See, for example, in California, it's magnificent. You can buy liquor in the, in the grocery stores. God, don't, it doesn't have to be a special liquor store. It gets the, yeah, the license, muckety-muck license. So the liquor is much cheaper, of course, and, and, and much more competitive. Also, uh, in Las Vegas, for example, liquor stores open 20, I mean, grocery stores open 24 hours a day, supermarkets. So you can buy liquor, it's magnificent. Three in the morning, well, and I guess they close the liquor up after about one o'clock or something. Shut down the liquor section. <laughs> but anyway, it's <laughs> much easier to buy it. How do they reach the airlines? Oh, that was due to deregulation. That was the, um, yeah, that was in the late 70s, early 80s, when the deregulation hit. You start having, because before that, you see, the, the rates were regulated by the, by the Civil Aeronautics Board. And so the airlines put in, the big airlines put in the Civil Aeronautics Board. And so uh, they kept the price for rates way up and they kept the, the competition way down. They signed routes, like Boston and New York route can only be Eastern and things like that. So now, of course, the sky's the limit. Anybody can nip in any, any area. So, of course, the, the inefficient airlines started going bust and new, new airlines came in with more competitive rates and then. No frills and all the rest of it. Radio not regulated. Pardon? Radio not regulated. No, the radio has still not been deregulated. As a matter of fact, there's a there's a woman now as head of the Interstate Commerce Commission, as a favor of eliminating the Interstate Commerce Commission and deregulating all trucking and all um, the other thing they run buses, I guess, but not railroads. She wants to keep railroad rates. So that, that, that's of course the thing that's been killing the railroad all this regulation. So it's still yeah. Two hundred thirty dollars for uh, air. Yeah. 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 Well, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I realize that realize it's purely subsidized. I mean, right now it's all the taxpayer pays for this stuff. And uh, I think, according to a friend of mine who's in the transportation econ economist, I asked him the question: If all subsidies and all controls were eliminated, if, we, if you had entirely free markets in transportation, what would what do you think would be the you know, what would be used in different areas. Of course, you can't predict it, but uh, his hunch was that basically you'd have for, for long, long mileage, long haul freight, you have railroads. And best for long haul freight, like freight from New York to California or something. Um, and for long haul passengers, of course, airlines. Right? And then for short haul, and that's for commuting stuff, uh, buses for, uh, buses for, for passengers and, and uh, trucks for, uh, the freight. Yeah. That would be about it. So I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, so the whole railroad, railroads shouldn't be any short term railroads, all kept up by the taxpayer for the benefit of a few wealthy people in Greenwich, Connecticut or something. Subsidized. Why should they be subsidized? <laughs> Nobody's nuts. But anyway, that's the. Um, they're trying to sell Amtrak. You know, the, 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 at least one wing of the Reagan administration is trying to privatize, get rid of all this stuff. I don't think it would be very successful, but at least they're talking about it, which is very unusual. Trying to sell Amtrak. Even trying to sell a couple of dams. And it's an amazing thing when the government's trying to sell some dams, because there had been a dam, dam propaganda now from about a century. All dams are good per se. For some reason, even because they're there and they have this water flowing over them, that sort of thing. Fortunately, there's several rollback now and reevaluation of the dam question, both by, by economists on the one side and environmentalists on the other. Of course, environmentalists are trying to save little fish or stuff, stuff like that. But anyway, it's sort of an co anti dam coalition between free market economists and environmentalists. That's kind of interesting. Would you like security by selling gas? Pardon? Would you like security by selling gas? Violate security? What is that? Supposedly, you're supposed to get the gas to buy the quantity. Oh yeah. Oh no no, this, you have to worry about that because the, the producers are liable. See, if you don't have, if you have construction, after all, there, there's houses all the time, and they, they're not they're not government. They're private houses being built, private offices built, they don't collapse. If they did collapse, they'd be, the, guys, the guys would be liable. I mean, the, the guys who use unsafe equipment could go to jail for 20 years or something. Plus, uh, 
you know, plus pay through the nose. So they they have an economic incentive not to, not to build unsafe unsafe stuff. Much more than with the government, because the government's never liable. The government can always say, well, it's due to somebody, somebody else's fault. So um, I think on a safety question, the private people are much more responsible because they can get things hit, get hit in the pocketbook. They use shoddy equipment and stuff. <clears throat> um, the, uh, so anyway, that's the. Uh, anyway, so that's the one on the whole retail question. We, now, we have a, a whole history of. of and each time, the finally innovation triumphs. I mean, efficiency finally triumphs after a long hysterical attack. And uh, and now, the, I don't know of any recent big development. There's the peddlers, of course. They're still trying to get rid of peddlers. That's, that's I guess, it's been forever. <laughs> At any rate, uh, well, you, but you can you can bet your bottom dollar that whatever new big thing comes in the retail industry will be com combated by a whole bunch of people who are now competing against it. <clears throat> uh, one interesting thing, uh, we're simply getting to labor in a second. Um, is that one of the big charges the leftists have always made against capitalism is that capitalism took the people, took the masses out of their beloved home. They used to work at home. In other words, in the old days, if you're a weaver, let's say you had your equipment at home, your loom in the basement, and you lived by at one, it's usually one hut, you, your family, and a loom, and a couple of pigs are all in one room. This is a traditional peasant hut. <laughs> Anyway, so they yanked capitalism, they yanked these people out of their beloved huts and took them into, brought them into the factory where they had to stay there eight hours or ten hours a day or something. But of course, they got a lot more money, but somehow their, their soul was, was, was robbed and they, they, they were alienated from their, from their labor. So capitalism brings about alienation and so forth and so on. But here we have, now we have a situation where there's a, a, a counter drive, in other words, with, with the computer and stuff like that. A lot of people now can work at home and are working at home. And so the, so the leftists are now bellyaching about that. Terrible thing, they can undercut union wage scales. You know, they don't join unions, obviously. If you're working at home, you're not going to join a union. So they're trying to outlaw that. So the same people who are attacking capitalism for alienating people from their home <laughs> are now trying to force them to work in somewhere else <laughs> to prevent them from working at home. <laughs> One more contradiction in the internal struggle. Anyway, now I get to labor and the labor situation uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, there's been a lot, and most historians, it's not true of Hughes, but in general, most historians have traditionally overweighted the whole labor, the whole union problem. Um, the number, as we'll see in a minute, the number of people joining unions is very small throughout. <clears throat> and um, it really, it's of course dramatic, it's newsworthy if you have a strike, but it really didn't mean that much in the, in the, in the overall picture. Uh, again, in the overall picture, what happens is that wage rates, real wage rates, in other words, Wage rates corrected for changes in price went way up all during the late 19th century. Um, here's one uh, one way of looking at it. Um, this is the average wage rate, average daily wages in industry, all industry. Of course, a rough figure, but it gives you, I think, a good idea. But uh, average daily wages in all industry. Because a lot of historians used to claim that workers were somehow oppressed during the late during the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Uh, you can see what kind of oppression it was. In 1865, we set wages equal to 100. In other words, there's an index where the average wage in 1865 is equivalent to 100. In 1891, in, in, in money terms, okay, this is the money wage rates, uh, this is going up by 13%. In other words, it's now 13% increase in money terms from 1865 1891. Okay? Plus 13%. Uh, the cost of living in the same time, don't forget there was deflation this whole period. In other words, prices kept falling throughout because, because the, basically because the in, in increase in production of goods and services was much greater every year than the increase in the money supply. If you have increase in money supply was fairly small, Increased production was tremendous, and so you had a, a big drop in, in other words, you had this sort of thing. This is a price on the y-axis and quantity on the x-axis. This is supply and this is demand. Supply kept increasing a lot, overcoming any increases in the money supply. So prices kept falling this whole period. So the cost of living went from 100 to 69. In other words, there's a 31% drop. Um, and prices, can you imagine a 31% drop in prices over a 26 year period? So a drop of slightly more than 1% a year. Uh, so in, overall, in real terms, the average daily real wage 
okay, correcting for uh, deflation this time, went up by 64 percent, 164. So we had, in other words, a uh, something like two percent a year or three percent a year increase in real wages steadily for these 26 year period. And it really goes on until 1900. In addition to that, the number of hours a day worked, the average hour a day. Don't forget, in those days people worked a lot. I mean, worked very hard. They worked 64 hours a week or something. And um, the hours dropped in this period from 11 hours a day and the average to 10. So you had, in other words, in addition to a 64% increase in real wages, you have, um, what is it, something like another extra amount uh, since you're with an additional 10% per hour wage rate. So it's like 74%. Uh, in this whole period, take the uh, union, union membership rate. You take the labor force, I mean the number of people working uh, or seeking work, total labor force, uh, in 1897 was uh, 26 million. And the number of the total union membership 1897 was 440,000, which is 1.7%. That's about that was about the norm. That's not unusual. This whole period. I mean, from 1880s until 1914, approximately, union membership was about two percent. Range, I will see, it fluctuated a little to some extent, but basically, it was a very small proportion of labor force. It wasn't really worth talking about <coughs> very much. Huh? Total union membership. In other words, this is, this is the total labor force, number of people who are working, 26 million. Of that, 440,000 were union members, which makes it one, about 1.7% 1 of the total. Um, the. Um, Did you say there's a sudden deflation these days? No, there's no deflation. They're talking about deflation, but prices prices are still going up by about three percent a year. And the price of oil yeah, the price of oil fell. On the other hand, if you look at the overall picture, prices are still going cost of living is still going up by three percent a year. No, it's just one it's one important price. It's not the whole story. Uh, there's, all, there's lots of prices going on, and it's just one aspect of it. And the fact that the material prices keep falling, on the other hand, general prices, you know, overall cost of living goes up as a, a sign. And don't forget, during the 1950s, uh, the government tried to keep, their target was that prices should go up no more than 2% a year. They figured that was the limit of inflation. And anything above 2% is considered a terrible thing. Now, 3.5% is considered to be no inflation at all, which shows we're We've been desensitized from inflation. It's not that inflation is eliminated, just we don't think there is any because it's better. Three and a half percent is better than thirteen percent. I suppose it is, but it's not. It's not the whole picture. So I have to watch that. The problem of desensitization to, to inflation. Uh, the, the, it weakens people's will, will to do something about it. Um, can unions come in? The first. Well, first of all, before the Civil War, there's no, there no real room for unions because most people were not employed. Most people were self-employed. The, the standard situation was to be self-employed. If you're a manufacturing, was very small, like a small barrel maker or a bicycle, not not poor bicycle, barrel maker or horseshoe or something like that. You usually have the master craftsman who's employed, owns his own shop, and then a journeyman is employee, and you know, maybe an apprentice. That, that's it. So even though there were there were outfits that call themselves labor groups, they were not really labor in our sense. They weren't you know, really particularly employed. Um, so only after the Civil War, with factories, you have a large number of employed people. Uh, and uh, so what first happens is that the, um, um, the first organization to try to do, organize union, uh, laborers was the Knights of Labor, founded in 1869, uh, which is essentially a socialist, socialist outfit. And uh, since the Knights of Labor believe in labor solidarity above all things, they didn't see the need for any kind of separate unions. In other words, what they did is they, they, um, everybody, you just join up geographically. In other words, everybody's a member of the Knights of Labor. If you show up, doesn't matter what you're working at, you simply become a geographical member. I'll say if, if, if downtown Brooklyn here was a, would be local 786 or something like that, you just join up, doesn't matter what your occupation is, you become a member of the Knights of Labor 
Local 786. So obviously, since there was no, since everybody was amalgamated in one, it was called one big union, the concept of one big union. Because everybody was amalgamated in one big union, there was no collective bargaining going on because there's nothing, nobody to bargain with. There's no, there's no committee of, of, of steel workers or something like that. Uh, so this, uh, this really, really went national by 1878. So it, it, it existed in a very small uh, amount, and it reached a peak in 1886, and by 1890 it totally collapsed. In other words, it was a big a sort of a sort of a flurry and a bingo, the whole thing was over. And uh, with the collapse of the Knights of Labor, some shrewd, smart, shrewd union people began to come to the conclusion that there must be another way, there's something wrong with the Knights of Labor, it didn't, it didn't work. And one of the reasons it didn't work is because it was one big union. Because there's nothing for them to do except preach socialism. There's no, there's no direct activity. And so, uh, as a result, was founded another group uh, based on a, very, a whole different concept. And uh, this is the concept of a craft union. The um, idea of a craft union is to control labor supply. In other words, to try to take a situation, an occupation, usually a skilled craft, where the, there's a natural limitation on entry. In other words, see, everybody can be a ditch digger. Anybody's got a, a shoulders to be a ditch digger. So you can't organize ditch diggers. This is the concept. You can only organize people uh, to, who are skilled, very small supply of skilled craftsmen. Uh, one, one ideal now, for example, would be stonemasons. There are almost no stonemasons left. And eight or nine in the country, and usually elderly Italians, and that's it. If you have eight or nine people in stonemasonry, you can easily to organize, easy to organize them because, uh, well, it's for various reasons. One is a skill kind of small, uh, limited entry. Okay, that's one one reason. You take a skilled craft, which is limited entry and also requires a lot of skill to become a, a, a stonemason. You can't just walk in and become a stonemason. You have to be an apprentice for ten years or something. Okay, so you have things like stonemasons. You have things like Cigar band workers, usually not mechanized. You see, in other words, in most cases, these are skilled craftsmen, me mechanics in the old, old-fashioned sense. You fit the stuff together, you fit parts together. You have mechanics, you have uh, cigar work, cigar workers, hand cigar workers, uh, glass blowers, another occupation which I'm afraid going forever uh, with mechanization and things like that. No, it's still skilled craft. We have a Limited entry, only a few people can join it and be in it. And two, another very important thing is the demand curve for the labor is inelastic. In other words, you have this sort of situation. Uh, <clears throat> if the demand curve is elastic, okay, this is a demand for, let's say, ditch diggers, the elastic. If you form a ditch diggers union and, and insist on raising the wage rate, you will disemploy a whole bunch of them. In other words, this is a, how many people will be hired, the man curve. This, on the y axis, you now have wage rate. So if you push the wage rate up from here to here, you disemploy you know, half, the, half the number of ditch diggers, or more than half. If you have a heavy unemployment, you'll break the union, because the, union, the guys will go, just go out there and, and undercompete the union, and uh, the union will be smashed. So you have to have, in order for the union to be successful in pushing out wage rates, have inelastic demand curve, where if you push up the wage rate for, say, stonemasons, you might disemploy one person. You have 10 people employed, you might disemploy one guy. So in other words, you're trying to have a situation where you always will have unemployment as a result of unions pushing up wage rates. So at least, if it's a small amount of unemployment, the union can get away with it. And at best for the union, of course, if you don't disappoint anybody, simply don't employ a new person coming in, like somebody would have been employed at the age of 21, he's no longer employed. So the unemployment is not visible. Okay? even better from the point of view of the union. So if you can do that, if you can have that in, an inelastic demand curve and a limited entry, then you have the conditions ready to form a successful craft union. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons it gives you an inelastic demand curve is a small proportion of the labor force. In other words, just a small number of people. Small proportion. So these are the aspects that have um, Of economic power, in other words, can push out wage rates at the expense of un unemployment. Uh, at small proportion, because then it's not, it's not a, a significant part of the payroll. You don't raise costs for the employer very much. To give you an example, I think a classic example, which I use in one of my micro classes, not unions, 
and poly here, we used to have two big unions. We had the staff workers union, the big union, all of us have the poly. Right? You have 200 members of something, the staff union, which belongs to the retail clerks union. And the, the faculty, we used to belong to the AUP, which is a mass union of 250 whatever faculty members. They had no power at all. They, had a lot, they made a lot of noise because there were more, more people, and they yelled a lot. They had no power. They couldn't could, could, could get, could get a damn thing. Okay? Because if the faculty got a 50% wage increase, it would bankrupt Poly. Because that, that would mean a huge increase in cost. On the other hand, you had two or three boiler tenders belonging to the very teeny but important boiler tenders union. And so <laughs> I remember years ago, about 18 years ago or something, the boiler tenders union went out on strike. And then we had big unions. The faculty was a big union then and so forth. They went to the boiler and they had one picket somewhere around the corner so nobody sees them. And, uh, and they went up to them and said, you want us to have solidarity? You want us to pick it with you? They said, no, leave us alone. Leave. Buzz off. <laughs> We're not interested in you worker solidarity. <laughs> and so, sure enough, there was, was a formal strike. Uh, two weeks, three weeks by these three guys, the Boiler Tenders Union. And, sure, and finally, Polly settles after about three weeks. Gives them a 50% wage increase. Because if you could probably get a 40 a 50% wage increase to three people, not to 400 people. Okay? That's the difference. So you have then, in other words, an inelastic demand curve, small proportion of the payroll, and small entry. Because that's too, you know, probably the boiler tenders are probably a fairly skilled occupation. You can't just walk in, walk in and become a boiler tender. So, with these conditions set, you're going to have a situation for successful craft union. So, the unions that have the economic power, in other words, the power to raise wage rates above the, the market level, are not the large unions with lots of members and make lots of noise and we've got a lot of publicity in the paper. These are the small little unions of the interstices of, of the market where they can get in, cut, cut employment and raise wage rates without too much evident disruption. <laughs> now what happens of course to the people means that people can't get into the occupation. You can't become a boiler tender very easily. Tight control over the craft. Uh, these unions usually have very tight control. They're, co they're usually considered racist because they don't they're not really racist in the correct sense. They really, what happens is the standard situation is you can't become a union member, say, electrician in Hoboken. Hobo, electrician's union, very powerful union. Uh, you can't become an electrician unless you're the son or the son or nephew of an existing union member. Of course, nowadays, I suppose, with, with the affirmative action or whatever, they've probably broken that a little bit. But this was the classic situation. You can't become a uh, member of the union, unless you're the son or nephew of an existing union member. Well, I mean, this, this cuts out, of course, other races. It also cuts out non-relatives. <laughs> All non-relatives need not apply. But, and, of course, you can't become an electrician in Hoboken unless you're a member of the union. It's a, a virtually closed shop situation. Your, your, your house is bombed or whatever it is. It's, 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 <laughs> it's tight control of this little area of the labor force. So this means Wage rates of electricians are pushed up at the expense of who? Not, not so much the employer, but to some extent, but largely to the extent of other workers who would like to be electricians and can't do it. They have to become supermarket clerks or whatever. And this is another word, or move out of Hoboken. And so the result is an increase in the supply curve for other occupations which don't have tight unions. So this means a, a fall in wage rates for supermarket clerks, filling station attendants or whatever. So what you have then, the way unions get their power is not by exploiting employers particularly, but by exploiting other workers, by exploiting non-union workers or workers with less, un less powerful unions that can't, can't maneuver this way. They've got a lot more people that, that can't control the supply that, that much and so forth and so on. So what you had in this whole period, 1880s to 1914, was a situation where unions were very small proportion, like 2% or so, and they only flourished in skilled craft situations. And the, the theoretician of this, uh, or the, the practitioner was Samuel Gompers, who was the head of the Cigar Workers Union, who um, <clears throat> was a, uh, became head of the American Federation of Labor, formed in 1886, as the exemplar of this kind of, of the craft concept, head of the American Federation of Labor. Um, The American Federation of Labor, the AFL, had no power itself. It was really sort of a propaganda aspect. The real power belongs, and still belongs, by the way, to the National Union, the National Cigar Worker Union, or whatever it is. Uh, and there are national unions and there are locals. Usually the National Union has total power over locals, and, uh, each local. And then uh, they're part of the Federation, but the Federation itself only is, they endorse candidates and they make speeches. They don't really do anything. They don't have any concrete power. So the National Union can leave the AFL anytime it wants to, and it often has. 
Uh, <coughs> yeah. No, well, that's a guild. Yeah, so they're not technically called a union because they're self-employed usually, but they're certainly they act as a as a monopolistic guild. Sure, it's very similar. Very good supply themselves. Beg pardon? Yeah. 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 Oh, sure. They, but they get this government that reduces supplies for them. We'll see how that happened in 1910 with the with the Flexner report. <coughs> how the doctors they were able to get control of medicine and especially licensing in medical schools and hospitals, and thereby kicking out all, reducing the supply tremendously. They had to use the government to do it. We're not talking about unions that do this without the government, you see. In other words, we're able to have a successful kind of union without government uh, support or, or right. Uh, it's very limited, as I say. It's limited, it's also limited to craft unions, and most of these unions were, uh, we'll have a little break in a minute, but most of these unions were Concentrate in certain industries or occupations. Okay, there were the building trades, what's known as the building construction unions, uh, carpenters, joiners, masons, uh, and machinists, and so forth. All these things were construction, of course, has always been the most reactionary part of the economy, at least most backward, at least innovative. And largely it's because construction is not a very competitive. Industry between uh, between uh, re, uh, between cities or between <coughs> locales. In other words, if you're a garment firm, let's say, if, you, if, if New York City is unionized and pushes the cost of garment production way up, you just you know the garment plant closes and, and goes into goes to West Virginia or something, starts there and competes with the, with the clothing produced in New York. But in, in construction, you don't really have that kind of competition. If New York City is unionized, New York City construction unionized, you don't just move to Chicago construction firm. In other words, construction doesn't compete that easily closely with other cities. So since construction is sort of geographically monopolistic in a sense, it leaves room for this kind of skilled craft unionism. So building trades were heavily unionized throughout. Uh, the, uh, in the railroad industry, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers, which was the, known as the aristocracy of the railroad industry, the guys were, you know, the guys blowing the whistle away on the cab. Uh, but they were the only ones that were unionized before the ICC came in. The ICC came in 1886. This was expanded to the to the, law, to the skilled craft and railroad, the so-called Big Four Brotherhoods. These are known as the Brotherhoods. Um, and uh, these were, the, let's see, the engineers, the firemen, I forget who the other two guys were. Two Big Four Skilled craft, the, the non the non skilled uh, railroad people, like the you know guys that the sort of janitorial types of reporters, were not were not uh, were not unionized. These were the skilled craft in the ra railroad industry, and all, these only really came in with the ICC. With the ICC, by the way, since the ICC essentially cartelized the railroad industry, it permitted broad end racial discrimination into the railroads before 1886. Uh, blacks were there was strong black contingent and and, rail, and railroad engineers, firemen, and all the rest of it uh, in the South and, and other places. And blacks were mostly in the South then. As soon as the ICC came in, the railroads were cartelized. They didn't have to worry about being profitable and so forth. Blacks were systematically kicked out of the top jobs in the railroad industry. Engineers, firemen, all the rest of it pushed down to, to porters and uh, janitors. Uh, and then uh, that's. Really, mostly, and then the various skilled crafts, cigar, dumpers uh, comes out of the cigar workers, glass blowers, etc. And really, that's about, and the only other one is really was anthracite coal. Uh, anthracite coal, contrasted by bituminous coal, which is the, gets most of the publicity, but bituminous coal is found everywhere. I mean, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, all over the place. Anthracite coal is limited to a very small section around Scranton, around eastern Pennsylvania. So therefore, it's fairly easy to monopolize it, to unionize it, because it's a very small geographical monopoly. And so you get one union in a little area, and that's it. So they were successfully unionized. And that's really about it. There was not too much else. They tried it all the time with garment firms to unionize that, especially because they're ideologically uh, devoted. They're immigrants from Eastern Europe. They're devoted to unionism per se and socialism. They couldn't succeed very well, even with that ideological devotion. Uh, within that framework, what also would happen, if you take a, um, a graph on the y-axis percentage of union membership, percentage of labor force, okay, union membership, and this is time, 
say 1880s to 1914. And this whole period uh, would, would go from about 1% to 6%, something like that. Uh, the 6% would be in the business cycle boom period. When you had a boom, <coughs> a boom situation, uh, this means the demand for labor would go up. So wage rates would tend to go up. In that situation, people would join unions, so they thought the unions would claim responsibility. Hey, we got your higher wage rates, even though the cause was not unions, the cause was the boom. So union membership would go up, say, from 1% to 6% in the boom period. As soon as the recession came, and the, and the demand for labor fell, the unions would be smashed because they try to keep the wage rates up, and this caused massive unemployment, and unions would be broken because they, the workers would simply compete, undercut union wage rates to get jobs, and go right back down to 1%. This was a classic situation during the pre-1917 pre period, from 1886 to 1917. This is a traditional situation. A very small proportion unionized, uh, most, and mostly during boom periods, which then recede in recessions, and limited to a very small skill craft, usually concentrated in things like building trade, uh, railroad brotherhoods, and the FSI coal. Uh, the only other union before 1930s, before the New Deal came in, which was successfully unionized, which doesn't meet these conditions, a musician's union. And uh, <laughs> the apparently, my professor who taught me labor economics from her uh, Bible is great truth, I couldn't understand that. He said, well, musicians are crazy anyway. It was the only explanation. <laughs> I think probably <laughs> a better explanation is that musicians are willing to be 90% unemployed, which most of them are. In other words, they love music so much. It's something like acting, too. Acting is, of course, not heavily unionized, but they, 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 they're willing to be unemployed most of the time, be waiters and so forth, waiting for their big chance, or waiting to, you know, to, to play music once. And most occupations, they're not willing to, sit, to settle for that, obviously. They're not willing to sit still for this 90% unemployment rate. So generally, that was the concentration. Unions were not that important, and uh, they were craft unions. They, they gave up any kind of idea of changing the world. What they wanted was higher wage rates and, and better working conditions. That was it, and it was collective bargaining on this, on this local level. And the theoretician, Samuel Gomper is a great practitioner in this. The theoretician uh, was Felix Perlman, who wrote a, was a, was a was an economist for Gomper, who wrote, wrote a book on the theory of labor unions in the United States, which propounded this doctrine. The Marxist myth of worker solidarity. There is no worker solidarity. It's a lot of nonsense. And the, as you see, the craft union succeeded by essentially shafting other workers who are not skilled craftsmen. Uh, and also on the, on the national level, this is what happens. In other words, the national level, the people who call for immigration restrictions were, of course, the unions. In other words, by keeping out <coughs> immigrants, you push the supply curve to the left, and you raise wage rates of workers who are behind this barrier. And of course, in the long run, means the International Division of Labor is hurt and all sorts of other stuff, but usually these special interests don't care about the long run. They're interested in short-term exclusion <coughs> of, co of competition. America was built on free immigration. It was one of the great things about America was that it was um, no restrictions on immigration. And uh, with immigration, we had the greatest industrial success, the greatest industrial growth, uh, greatest growth in standard of living. However, uh, union forces in favor of limiting immigration so as to keep out competitors, worker competitors. In other words, workers compete with each other just as employers compete with each other. Workers don't compete with employers. So the key thing is that restrictions on labor migration or advance are almost always lobbied for by other labor groups. Uh, in the case of the United States, the first restriction on immigration comes in the late 19th century with, a, with bitter hatred of Chinese and, and restrictions on Chinese immigration. The important thing, again, about labor uh, migration is that a economics and race is a powerful combination. Racism by itself is unimportant. Racism by itself is simply a sort of a social thing. You don't get into a you know, certain club, who the hell cares? But when you combine race with economics, when it comes to somebody's economic interest to keep out Chinese or Italians or whatever, then you have a powerful combination and the two things reinforce each other, which is what happens with immigration restriction in the United States. So the first people to get the force of this was Chinese immigrants. The Chinese began to migrate to the United States around 1850. And they did extremely well, uh, mostly, of course, on the West Coast, as you might expect. They did extremely well. They were usually efficient, industrious. All the rest of the virtues of, of the labor force, thrifty, came in almost no capital. And immediately, of course, white workers began to agitate to keep them out, kick them out. Terrible thing, they're evil, they're, they're coolies, whatever it is, is because uh, they were being outcompeted, indeed, uh, by better workers, and they didn't like it, and they used a, a racial uh, weapon. 
to try to exclude them. Uh, the first thing the Chinese settled on mass in western mining districts in the mountain states and did extremely well. They take an abandoned mine, like a crummy mine, and do very well with it, not making it profitable. So the white miners began to agitate very quickly by 1852 to, to prevent Chinese immigration, to kick them out. And they used force, both private and governmental, to kick the, kick the Chinese out of the mining districts. They lynched the Chinese, they burned their houses down, and so forth and so on, and they the state and local governments would pass laws prohibiting Chinese from entering the mining districts and working in the mines. And it's unbelievable to think of it. About 20 or 30 years later, the Supreme Court declared most of these laws unconstitutional. But by that time, it was too late. Really, the effect was immediate. <clears throat> so there's whole horror stories about this. There's um, uh, violence was used, and, and uh, say state laws were used to, to especially tax Chinese mines and so forth and so on. In that way, by violence, the China, both governmental and private, the Chinese were driven out of the mining areas and that went to the cities like San Francisco and railroad work. Of course, once again, they, the white workers started bellyaching about Chinese railroad workers, except when, when work became dangerous and you had to go up mountain graves, etc. And they said, okay, well, let's allow the Chinese to do that. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so the. Uh, and the, and the people leading the parade, and, 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 as a theoretical level, so to speak, leading the parade of anti-Chinese exclusion and agitation were the Knights of Labor, and those first the Knights of Labor, and then the American Federation of Labor later on. Terence Powderly, usually considered by liberal historians, left-wing historians, as a heroic left-wing figure, I guess in a sense he was a left, certainly a left-wing figure, not heroic, who was the head of the Knights of Labor. Terence Powderly called for the total elimination of all Chinese in the United States, kick them all out. So, Powderly. Um, and uh, the Knights of Labor adopted this as their, one of their big planks. <coughs> um, and uh, <coughs> again, the, uh, the, there was murders of Chinese driving, driving them out of mining areas. In 1877, the Working Man's Party of California, which is a labor party, uh, of workers and unions, it was, was a fairly strong party, a big third party in California for about 30 years. It was founded by Dennis Carney, a powerful political figure, came out for progressive income tax, welfare state, and kicking all Chinese out of the United States. <clears throat> as he put it, quote, we propose to rid the country of cheap Chinese labor as soon as possible and by all means in our power, by any means necessary would be the current phrase. They also marked as public enemies and listed in the newspapers or whatever, all employers who would refuse to fire Chinese workers. Uh, there was also legal persecution of, 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 in California of Chinese workers. Uh, in California, for example, in 1870, outlawed the employment of all, any Chinese in public works projects. Uh, two years later, they outlawed Chinese, prevented Chinese from owning any real estate or getting business licenses. As I say, about 20, 30 years later, this is, the Supreme Court declared it's unconstitutional. Uh, they put special taxes on Chinese. What they do is things like this. For example, Chinese had less capital than other workers. They started with virtually nothing. So San Francisco, for example, charged an $8 license fee per year for horse-drawn laundry wagons, but $60 for foot laundry men. In other words, Chinese didn't, weren't wealthy enough yet to have, to have horses on wagons. They, they, they carry the stuff on foot, laundry on foot. So there'd be especially high taxes on, on foot laundry men. Same thing with vegetable peddlers, where basket carriers, Chinese would have baskets. They spent $40 a year against $8 a year for, for a license fee for those who have wagons. Now this, remember, $40 meant something like $1,000 now, so they're quite, quite high. Also, in order to crush Chinese uh, businesses, they have maximum cubic foot laws for, say, laundries, so that uh, a cubic air ordinance, so you, ha you couldn't have less than 500 cubic feet of air in any laundry. So most of the Chinese laundries are small, and this would outlaw Chinese laundries and, and, and for the benefit of white laundries. <clears throat> also, there's a Q ordinance in uh, California, at San Francisco area, where uh, compulsory hair cutting. The Chinese used to wear pigtails, or cues as it's called, and they compulsory cut the hair, will, 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 you know, cut the hair off. So, I, I, again, eventually, of course, declared unconstitutional. Um, anyway, this goes on. There's a whole horror, list of horror stories I have in this thing. It's on and on, endless. And again, the leaders in all this were the, first the working man's, the Knights of Labor, then the working man's party in California, and then the craft unions. When the AFL gets strong in the 1880s, they pick up the cry. For example, in San Francisco, 40 labor unions in April 1880 set up the League of Deliverance, what they meant as the League of Deliverance from Chinese Americans. Um, and the head of it was a socialist and a member of the 
Siemens Protective Union, which was a working man's party socialist group. Uh, they had 4,000 members in California. They promoted a giant boycott. The idea is to boycott all goods made by Chinese labor and uh, boycott merchants who employ Chinese, who sell Chinese labor products. Matter of fact, the first example of a boycott in the United States was an anti-Chinese boycott. Uh, the, uh, and the boycott tactic begins, by the way, with Samuel Gompers, uh, who's the white, ch white cigar workers are being outcompeted by large cigar firms used to employ Chinese labor, Chinese cigar labor. And they, they would outcompete the uh, inefficient white Chinese, white cigar workers. So the Gompers comes up with a tactic of what's called, what was called the white label, now called the union label. We all know about union labels and clothing, etc. And it originated as a white label. And, uh, and so the so, so cigar, cigars, for example, made an inefficient, high cost white workers plant which had a white label, and of course the, the Chinese made ones didn't. Uh, and, uh, and by, by the mid 1880s, seven eighths of the cigars in, in, in San Francisco, for example, were made by Chinese workers and, lo and, and low cost plants. So the white label comes in, they form a white cigar makers association to lead the boycott along, of course, with the union. Again, an example of union industry cooperation. The white, the white cigar workers combining with inefficient white cigar factory firms, manufacturing firms, to try to boycott and, out and crush the lower cost Chinese labor people. Um, and, uh, and of course, Gompers then takes the lead in exclu Chinese exclusion to try to keep Chinese from coming in and, pr and preferably to kick them out. <coughs> um, the, finally, by late 1885, and the, this pressure of the boycott, etc., the San Francisco large cigar firms agreed to fire all the Chinese workers and replace them with white workers. Uh, another thing, in 1885, was a, a, a giant Council of Congress in San Francisco of 64 Pacific Coast unions, including Knights of Labor, anarcho-communists, anarchists, Socialist Labor Party, and, other, and craft unions, all united on the idea of kicking out all Chinese from the United States, so certainly from, from San Francisco area. And the only disagreement was, should they be kicked out, should we give them two months to leave or two days? That was the, the, the range of opinion. The most extreme was the anarcho-communist Siemens Union, which called for kicking out Chinese immediately. Um, at any rate, the, uh, as, one of the, as the, as the anarcho-communist leaders said, but by force is the only way to remove the coolie, and 20 days is enough to do it in. So they, they thought it was a big concession, it gives them three weeks. The state of California goes along with this by, pre one, preventing Chinese from becoming citizens, two, excluding Chinese children from public schools, three, trying to restrict Chinese immigration on a state level. At any rate, most of the agitation has ended in 1882 when the Congress, as a result of all this, passes the Chinese Exclu Exclusion Act, Preventing all Chinese from coming in, further Chinese from coming in, mostly under union pressure, and um, and Californians and the, of course the unionists were were disappointed that they did not did not kick out existing Chinese. About 100,000 Chinese Americans at that point did not go so far as to kick them out. <coughs> uh, Samuel Gompers again takes the lead. Just want to mention one of Samuel Gompers' officials, the uh, AFL official Herman Gutstadt. Wrote a pamphlet. In those days, the title used to be very long. You really didn't have to read the pamphlet; you just read the title and get the whole picture. The title of this pamphlet, in 1902, was but "This is when the Chinese Exclusion Act was up for renewal, 20-year act, and one of the agitate to keep it going." Some reasons for Chinese exclusion: colon meat versus rice. In other words, rice is somehow evil. <laughs> meat, <laughs> meat versus rice. American manhood against Asiatic cooliism, which shall survive. Uh, at any rate, uh, then comes the then the Japanese begin to immigrate by 1880 or so, and, and by 1900 they're going to come in, and then of course they start hysteria against the Japanese, especially in the Los Angeles area. The same stuff goes on, the same people. Then as Carney comes out of retirement in the 1890s to leave the uh, idea of Japanese exclusion against quote another breed of Asiatic slaves unquote. Uh, again, the labor unions lead the parade. The San Francisco labor unions, Los Angeles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Same damn thing happens. It's just uh, forming the Asiatic exclusion lead to exclude Chinese and Japanese uh, immigrants. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the AFL refused charters to Japanese farm workers' union because they were Japanese, Japanese Americans. Uh, and uh, Samuel Gomper is refusing a charter to a sugar beet union, sugar beet workers' union. Said, "Quote around 1905." 
Your union must guarantee that it will, under no circumstances, accept membership of any Chinese or Japanese. This is the great, this is the great far-sighted humanistic uh, labor movement. Uh, at any rate, the same stuff goes on as finally Japanese Exclusion Act, and uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, so I just want to emphasize that the point of all this is not just to repeat a horror story. The point is to demonstrate that exclusion, racial racism, and as an economic and political measure, comes from the blend of race, race and economics. There was a blend of economic privilege with then using racial, whipping up racial sentiment as, as a way of doing it. And by the way, the same thing happened in South Africa. What's not realized in South Africa is the South African apartheid system was not put in by the Afrikaners or Boers. That was much later. It was put in originally by the white work, Anglo workers uh, after World War I when African workers began to rise up and become skilled laborers, rise up out of the unskilled and become foremen and things like that. And at that point, the white workers group got hysterical and said, we have to exclude Africans from, from being promoted. And the uh, Communist Party of South Africa, by the way, which led, the, led this exclusion principle, uh, organized a general strike in the early 1920s, the theme of which was to prevent all Africans from being, from being, you know, coming to skilled labor or foreman jobs. And uh, the theme, and the slogan was, white workers unite and fight for a better world. A Communist Party, of course, does not talk about this epoch in its history <laughs> at this point. But anyway, this is, and this won, this, the general strike won, and, and after that, the go government of South Africa, in response to this, prevented blacks from rising up into, into a skilled worker and, and, and foreman jobs. This really begins the whole apartheid. It began even before that with workers. That was one of the earliest examples. Okay, I want to get now to uh, start with Teddy Roosevelt. The next time, talk about Teddy Roosevelt's president, beginning of Teddy Roosevelt's president. So I want to talk about Teddy Roosevelt's early career. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, as you might expect, is one of my least favorite people in American history. I have many unfavorites. So Teddy is one of them right up there with the top. Uh, I can't imagine too many people I dislike more than Teddy. At any rate, um, Teddy, for example, liked killing for its own sake. He loved war, he loved murder. Uh, killing anybody, animals, people, doesn't make any difference. Um, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't care who he killed either. He wanted any kind of war. It didn't matter who the war was against. Spain, England, France, it doesn't make any difference. Germany, it didn't, didn't matter. As long as there was war. At uh, any rate, Teddy was, as I say, grew up in the Morgan ambit. His relatives were more the Oyster Bay, Roosevelt's were all Morgan. He goes to Harvard as a young uh, young lad and at Harvard College, and he marries uh, Alice Lee, who was the daughter of George Cabot Lee, one of the top Boston Brahmins, one of the top, of course, all connected with the Morgan interests, uh, and uh, related to the Lees, the Higginsons, and the Cabots, the top Boston financial aristocracy. 